worship this morning according to the abbreviated communion service beginning on page 15 in the front of the hymn. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson for this first Sunday in Advent from Malachi chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble, and that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. Then you will trample down the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I do these things, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. 
He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. So far the Old Testament lesson. Our psalm of the day, these words of Psalm 103. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. So far the psalm of the day. And our epistle lesson in our continuing study of Paul's letter to the Ephesians from chapter 6 beginning at verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. Behold, I come quickly. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel is written in the first chapter according to St. Luke, beginning at the fifth verse. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time came for the burning of incense, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him. He was startled, he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let us join in confessing our faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed as printed on page 18 in the front of the hymn. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. 
We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Our text in our continuing study of Paul's letter to the Ephesians from chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. You may recall that at the end of the catechism, Luther tacked on what we know as the table of duties for husbands and wives, parents and children, pastors and parishioners, labor and management. He set down the Bible passages that apply to each, he wrapped it all up with a rhyme. Let each his lesson learn with care, and all the household well shall fare. The household, of course, of God, as the Bible calls it, is made up of all kinds of different people. Parents and grandparents and children and grandchildren and husbands and wives and single folks and widows and working stiffs and bosses and pastors and parishioners, and teachers, and students, all of whom serve God at the altar of their various callings in life, letting their light shine from that pulpit, so to speak, where God has placed them. And so we have something like that here in Paul's letter to the Christians at Ephesus. He has explained to them the mystery of Christian marriage and how husbands and wives are to relate to each other in a Christian home. And today he urges children and parents to turn their hearts toward home. It is in many ways 
an Advent theme in the last lines of the Old Testament, as you heard. The prophet Malachi foretells the coming of the second Elijah, John the Baptist, the great forerunner of the Savior. He says, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and smite the land with a curse. That's it. Those are the last lines of the Old Testament. The prophet lays down his pen. Centuries go by. Many may have become weary of waiting. But eventually, the angel Gabriel appears in the holy place to an old priest named Zechariah as he is about to offer up the incense. He tells Zechariah that he and his aging wife, Elizabeth, will become the parents to a baby boy. The second Elijah, John the Baptist, borrowing the language of the prophet Malachi, the angel tells Zechariah that this child will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Where that does not happen, Nothing is left but a curse for those who are unprepared for the coming of Christ. And so here, in an Advent theme really, Paul is telling us what the prophet Malachi once told God's people. To turn our hearts toward home, both parents and children and children and parents. It begins this way. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Sometimes we miss the obvious. You know, these epistles or letters that Paul wrote by inspiration, they were read aloud to the congregations to which they were sent. Paul here addresses the children. This means the children were present in the worship service to listen to this. Children. He assumed that children would be present in the worship service. Later, a few verses, he says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Fathers. He assumes fathers will be present in the worship service with their children, that they will bring them, not just send them. He assumes that parents and children together will turn their hearts toward God and listen with their forgiven ears to what God has to say to each of them. Sometimes again we miss the obvious. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Paul assumes the children he's talking to are believers. That they are little hearts who have been baptized by Christ. That they trust in Christ. That he can appeal to them to obey their parents in the Lord. In other words, to obey their parents not because something bad's going to happen to them if they don't. But because of who and what they are. Baptized sons and daughters of the King of Kings who gladly turn their hearts toward their fathers. Children, turn your hearts toward home. The noblest thing you can do for God at this time in your life is to honor your father 
and mother. This commandment is tied up in your very friendship with Jesus. You see, this means cheerfully doing what your parents ask you to do. It means speaking respectfully to your parents and others in authority. It means muting that tone of attitude in your voice. It means being careful to show the kind of honor instead of this I'm too cool for you body language. It means learning to appreciate that the questions, endless questions, that your parents ask you, where are you going? What will you be doing? Who will you be with? When will you be back? That these are truly the way your parents love you. Now this, the Lord understands, gets harder for you as you edge toward adulthood as you understandably learn to think more independently and you wonder some days being conflicted well which am I today a child or a grown-up it's this maddening middle period of life modern culture calls it adolescence someone has compared this stage of your life to that thing that happens when astronauts come back to earth from outer space now if you've ever watched on TV the return of say the Apollo moon ships or in more recent years the space shuttles and so forth you know that everything heats up during the re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. And there is this communications blackout for several minutes in which the spaceship cannot communicate with mission control on Earth. There's just this static shh. If you've ever watched the movie Apollo 13, you know how everyone just sort of, spoiler alert, you know how everyone just sort of breathes a sigh of relief when all of a sudden the astronauts say something like, Odyssey here. Now something like this happens during this maddening stage of your life between childhood and adolescence. This blackout in communication. You think your parents do not understand you, even though they once were what you are. They, on the other hand, have a hard time getting through to you because you've clammed up and you don't talk to them the way that you used to. And they interrupt you when you are watching TV, call you away from the computer screen to do some household task. You act as though they just interrupted a presidential cabinet meeting. And so you are somewhat frustrated. You think perhaps that Yours is the first generation to feel this way. That your parents really do not appreciate the level of your own intelligence 
and that sadly your parents have an IQ that is only slightly above room temperature. Children, turn your hearts toward home. Obey your parents in the Lord because Jesus loved you and gave himself for you and wants nothing but the best for you. And so, turn your hearts to the wisdom of your fathers and your mothers and your grandparents. Turn your hearts again so that you stop thinking you're too sophisticated for the teachings of the Bible. Turn your hearts again to the Holy Scriptures which have been the treasured possession of your parents and grandparents and generations that have gone before. God knows it's tough to fight your own sinful nature, which, by the way, you inherited from your parents. He knows it is difficult for that very reason. This is the foremost commandment with a promise, a word of encouragement, if you will, to kind of encourage you. He says, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. You and I might be quick to point out exceptions we know of to this word of God's encouragement. Exceptions which God himself has made. Sometimes godly children are snatched away. Sometimes to spare them things that might have happened that only God knew about. Sometimes to call to repentance those who are left behind. Sometimes to teach us that life, real life, eternal life, always keeps its promise. But the exception proves the rule. Generally speaking, it is true. You will have a happier, healthier, longer life if you are not driving drunk, sticking needles in yourself and sleeping around. Generally speaking, it is true that things will go better for you if you turn your hearts toward home. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Father, this does not exclude moms, but God will not let fathers forget where the buck stops. They can't pass it. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Literally, don't make them angry. Making them angry, provoking them to an internal rage by unreasonable expectations. By an inconsistent example in your word, in your way of life. They will notice this. Fathers, do not provoke your children to an internal type of rage and anger. When they see that you yourself do not practice what you preach. Fathers, remember that you have a heavenly Father who is watching. Who wants you to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now this does not mean that fathers should abdicate their responsibility as leaders in their household 
used wisdom and understanding, even-handed discipline and kindness. It is not showing love to raise a spoiled brat who becomes the tail that wags the dog, who becomes the center of his or her, her own universe, who eventually becomes a burden to others and even to him or herself. You do hear of horror stories in the news. Abusive parents who lock their kids in cellars and starve them and beat them. Put them in cages. Horrifying. But what about parents who rob their children of all spiritual nourishment? Who keep them on a starvation diet when it comes to their immortal souls, who make sure that they have a nice house, good education, proper dental work, all kinds of sports and other activities to take care of them, nice video screens, but starve their souls and leave them wandering around in the world, figuring, well, they'll find their way to the Father somehow. This is nothing less than spiritual child abuse. It'd be nicer to drop them off in the woods somewhere and drive off. Fathers, get yourself and your kids out of bed on Sunday morning and bring them to God's house to worship God gladly. Let them see that a real man is not ashamed to talk about Jesus or to stand up for Jesus. that a real father can at least be a faint echo of their heavenly father. Long years and centuries have gone by since the prophet Malachi foretold the coming of a prophet who would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. John the Baptist came. So did Jesus. Now we await the second coming of our Savior, his advent in the clouds of glory. For you children who have failed, who hasn't? Christ became a child for you. And he made his obedience yours. For you fathers who have failed, who hasn't, you have a father in heaven whose compassions and mercies are new every morning. There is no better time before he comes once more. For fathers and mothers and sons and daughters and young and old to turn their hearts to our home. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
It hath pleased Almighty God to summon out of this veil of tears to our eternal home the soul of Scott Herman, who departed this life on Friday at the age of 41. Funeral services will be held here at the church on Wednesday at 11 a.m. Let us pray. O Lord God, thou Lord of life and death, who turnest man to destruction and sayest, Return, ye children of men. We give thee thanks for all the mercies which during his life thou didst bestow upon this our beloved brother now fallen asleep. Especially do we thank thee for having brought him to the knowledge of thy dear son, Jesus Christ. We pray thee, comfort the survivors with thine everlasting comfort, and cheer them with the sweet hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant to the lifeless body rest in the bosom of the earth, and hereafter together with us all a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us all to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom and finally be saved. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us offer up our prayers for Mike Horseman, who tomorrow will undergo knee replacement surgery in Viroqua. Merciful Lord and Savior, you have promised to be with your people everywhere and in all circumstances of life. May the assurance of your abiding presence and loving care comfort and sustain your servant as he undergoes surgery. Remove all anxiety and fear from his heart and lead him to rest all his confidence in you. Bless the work of the surgeon and give success to the surgery as it pleases you. Be with him as he recovers and fill him with an abiding thankfulness for all your blessings. In the name of our Savior who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the communion portion of the service, beginning on the top of page 23 in the front of the hymnal. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus strengthen and preserve you in the true faith, a new life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
God will spare you from the dead. Please read God.